All right, if you guys would open your Bibles up to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 as we continue our journey through Paul's letter to the Church of Corinth. And as you find it, we will be starting to read in verse 26, and we will be reading through verse 40. And as you find it, if you are able to, please stand out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. And Paul writes these words to the church in Corinth. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each one of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is to be made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy, prophecy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophecy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, thank you so much for your word. We just ask that your spirit would come down, open our hearts to the word, remove all darkness from this room, let there only be light. We pray that, that your will is done in each of our lives, and we pray that our eyes are open to your will. It's in Jesus' heavenly name that we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> So my question of the day this morning that I would like to ask is, why do you come to church? This is a question I would like you to ask yourselves this week. Why do I come to church? If someone were walking by the street, and as someone such as Doyle's story from last week, as he's wandering, driving by and going, I wonder what happens in that building. And they found out that you came to church here. I came up and asked, so why, why do you go there? What would your answer be? Why is it you do come to church? The, 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 one of the things that we've been discussing with Proverbs on the evening is, uh, is how, for many years, the church has been but a shadow of the true church. And here's the problem, is a shadow does not create another shadow. Uh, an example... Uh, you know, when I first became a Christian, uh, talking to a lot of the people that had grown up in church, had been in church their whole life, they, they were kind of the elders of the church, uh, and they would, they would tell great stories about, oh, every time the church doors were open, our family were there. If it was open on Sunday morning, we were there for the service. If it was open on Sunday night, we were there for the service. If it was open for prayer meeting, it was there for a service. And they talked with pride about it. And I, I would say, well, why did you go all those times? And they'd be like, well, we didn't have anything else to do. I was like, that's why you went <laughs> to church. And, and the, the, the problem, uh, part of the problem is the fact that uh, people don't, didn't have a true understanding of why they, were, why, why they were even at church. They were going to church because they needed something to do. They were part of a farm community. This is what we did on the weekend. This is where we went for fun and, and enjoyment. But I want you to think about some of the things that the church uh, is here for and why we come to, why we come to church. And uh, we live in a world, and the atheists, the hardcore atheists, the Richard Dawkins of the world are actually finding this out, that are 
teenagers or 20 somethings just don't care. There could be a God, there couldn't be a God. I really don't care one way or the other. It's kind of an uh, apoplectic uh, state of mind. And, and they're amazed that, hey, if Cindy wants to believe in God, she can believe in God. Good for her. If Steve wants to be a hardcore atheist, good for Steve. Wonderful for Steve. And, and so on. But, you know, we're just going to do what we do. And we see this a lot in what? You ask somebody, do you go to church? Do you believe in God? What's the common answer? Well, I'm spiritual. Well, what's that mean? <laughs> what's that mean to you? Well... I believe there is an afterlife. Well, what kind of afterlife? All right. So that kind of leads us in today's scripture and, and what I'm thinking here. Why do we come to church? There's a reason we come to church. There's a reason we come on Sunday morning. There's a reason we come on Sunday night. There's a reason that we pray solo. There's a reason that we pray corporate, corporately. And in the end, the thing is, is the church has a long tradition of separating. We have the pastors and the elders, and then we have uh, terminology, the everyday people, the laity. We have pastors to share the, share the gospel. We have pastors to do the visits. We have deacons. If somebody's in the hospital, we'll send the deacon. But the truth of the scripture is what? That we all are responsible for this. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, let us into this. Remember, the introduction that Paul has in the letter to the church of God that is in Corinth, though sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, what? Together with all those who in every place call upon the name Lord Jesus Christ, both the Lord and ours. In Ephesians 6, at the end of uh, verse 18 and leading into verse 20, he says this to the church in Ephesus, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me. The word may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I thought to speak. First and foremost, you guys are saints, but you guys are also ambassadors. And what's the job of an ambassador? We are to be claiming the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to be proclaiming who he is, what he did for us, and what he did for those outside. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 5 verse 20 says what? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Part of our worship and part of my job as pastor is, is to help and to remind you of who our God is on, on a weekly basis to encourage you. Because sometimes, brothers and sisters, life does bring us down. Sometimes we have the weeks where our dogs are sick, and we don't know if they're going to make it. There are weeks when we're sick, and we're wondering if we're going to make it. And there's times when the world bears us down and seems to weigh heavier and heavier, and that's when we need to be reminded who it is uh, is as our God and what He has, has done for us. Because there will come a day when every single one of us, that the weight will be removed from us. Jesus says what? My burden is what? Light. What I have to give you is light, for there will come a day I have died for you, I have given my life to you, I have paid the price for your sins, I have paid the price that you do not have to take the judgment of the Father upon you, you don't have to pay, take the judgment when I come on my seat of judgment, for the price has been paid, and there will come a day when there will what be what? We talk about it every week. No more fears, no more tears, no more worries, no more separation from the loved ones that are there with us. All Scripture points to the cross. All Scripture points to the cross. Again, why do we need reminding? Because the powers and the principalities of the world, the world itself, and yes, even our own flesh, will always tell you there are more important things to be doing than worshiping the God who died for you. There are more important things to be doing than, 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 than encouraging your brothers and sisters in Christ. There are more important things to be doing than, than loving God. And brothers and sisters, what happens when, when we decide not to go to church, when you want to know what 
is important in your life, look where you're spending your time and look what you're spending your money on. Those are probably the two biggest things in our world. What are you spending your money on, all your money on, and when, where are you spending your time? Look at where all your time and money goes, and that's what's truly important to you. We need reminding because we can easily be sidetracked by our own wants and search for happiness. Is there anybody in this room that doesn't want to be happy? But happiness can always be taken away. How many of us have had something come and make us happy? And we're like, oh, so exciting. And then five minutes later, something happens and boom, your happiness is gone. Jesus tells us that he's going to give us a joy. He has given us a joy that no one can ever take away because the price of our sin has been paid for. The price of our crimes against God has been paid for. That, that cosmic treason, as I like to put talk about that we've committed against God, we're traitors against God, has been paid for and taken away. And, and the joy is this, that for each of us there are treasures in heaven because of what he's done and the works that we're doing in this world. Here's the sad part, and we've talked about this earlier in, in, in the letter to the Corinthians, is there, there are some of us that are going to come up to come into heaven and treasures are going to be abound. Because we'll have had our focus on heaven. Jesus tells us what? Do not focus on the treasures in, of the earth, which what, one day, what? He says, will burn. But focus on your treasure in heaven, which can never be taken away and never can be removed. There are going to some of us that are going to look at the Billy Grahams and the Mel Mabras of the world that we can look back and we can see an obviousness of how much they love the Lord and the work that they did for the Lord and their treasures are going to be immense. And then there's other of us. Jesus is going to look at us and say, you worked for your treasures. You got them. You had them. And this is what you have now. There's part of us that goes, that's fine. No more fears, no more tears, no more worries, no more separation from loved ones in heaven. Amen. But it's our Lord and Savior Himself that makes a big deal of, of work for your treasures in heaven. Focus on your treasures in heaven because that's what's truly going to last you for all eternity. I want you to think briefly of the first verse in Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave Him to show His servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. And that word servant in the Greek is doulos. It is literally slave. A slave or servant is what? One who is always focused not on his will, but the will of his master. I wanted to ask you this. Are you here in this world for yourself? Are you thinking on a daily basis? We talk about the armor of God. How often do you put on the armor of God, Rosemary? Every day. Every day. And part of that armor of the God is focusing on ourselves on the will of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and, and looking. Each of us have different jobs. We have teachers in here. We have guys that have done construction in here. We have guys working at 3M here. We've got truck driver in here. And do, we, do we notice? Do we, we got people that work in Walmart. Do we notice and look and even think about how we can have an effect and how we can please God in what we do and how we can speak of Him and do it? And I, the one great thing about our church is I hear stories every day about how people have had an effect of people in their lives at their work and at their jobs. We stay focused on that will by, again, praying both individually and corporately, both equally important, daily Bible readings. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and what? Equipped. Equipped for every work, every good work. And of course, weekly worship, both to remember and give thanks to our God, to encourage one another. Hebrews 10, 24, 25, 
It says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And again, to be equipped. Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, that's my role, to equip the saints for every work, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to measure the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. These are the things that church are for. And then we roll into, after that short introduction, in today's, today's scripture. Paul has been talking throughout the letter to this church to Corinth about what? That, if you haven't figured it out, the last three chapters, that we should be focused for our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Part of the problem has been what? The church of Corinth has been focused on the I. On what I get out of church. What I do. You start all the way to the beginning. I'm here because I'm a follower of Apollos. I'm here because I'm a follower of Petros. I'm here because I'm a follower of Paul. And Paul made a big deal. It doesn't matter who your teacher is. They're all servants of the Lord Most High. He sent them to you to tell you about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the one you worship isn't your teacher, but you worship your God. And you worship your Lord. We see it in chapter 5 where they're, they're saying, Hey, we got a guy sleeping with his, his father's wife. And they're lifting themselves up. Look how tolerant we are. We allow that to happen in our church. Again, it's an I thing. Mostly what it was is I don't want to deal with the problem. But Paul says, if you love your brother, if you truly love them, then you will discipline him. And we went through the process there. Then we're getting into the order of service. And he's talked about the way people have been doing, doing Lord's Supper. Some of you are coming, he said, and you're bringing great dishes and you're making sure you get there early so you can eat the really good food because before the poor people get there. Again, what's the focus? Me. Myself, I. And then we've been focusing the last couple of chapters on what happens. And, and these are known as the great tongue chapters because it seems a lot of focus is on, on tongues. Because people are just speaking in tongues. Right and left, they're interrupting each other. They're, they're, there's a... Uh, a large disorder in their service. I was at a service once for another church. It's a really weird thing. They had special music going on, and the girls got up, and I was like, wow, they have really pretty voices. And just as they started singing about three sentences in, everybody got up and just started wandering around, talking to each other while they were singing, and it really threw me way off, but it was it, it was a a form. It was almost a form. The whole service was more of an ecstasy thing. How wonderful I feel! How great God makes me feel! And look, everybody, about how wonderful I feel, and how loud I can shout, and how much noise I can make because I love God. And this is what we talked about last week. What's that look like to an unbeliever? It looks like a bunch of nonsense. And what does that do? The believer or the visitor doesn't come back. We come into this this week, and Paul's really getting more into the order of service. In verse 26, What then, brothers, when you did come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation? I want you to notice it's not just the pastor that, that comes to build up the church. We have this here. We have people that come and do special music. Mary's wonderful at bringing us special music when she can. Songs that, that speak to us, that we want to share. Linda McGinnis comes every once in a while with a story she's read that she loves, that has spoken to her. We give time every once in a while, not every Sunday, of how the Spirit has spoken to you and how He's worked in your life. So you can share how the Spirit's 
been talking to you and working in your life, and we can share in your excitement for whatever it might have been. These are why we do the opportunities. The opportunity to build up and encourage is not just the pastor's job, it is all our jobs. To edify, to build up, to encourage. Not that every person needs to do something every single Sunday, but sooner or later we all partake and encourage one another. The point is this, I want you to imagine making this up on the fly. I, I've read Arnold Schwarzenegger's bodybuilding book, and I've decided that I'm going to want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, I didn't say it was going to happen, but you know, I have a dream. So I have a dream, but I'm up here every Sunday, and you see me, and I've got weights, but I'm only doing my right arm every week. I've gone like crazy for my right arm. What am I going to look like? I'm going to look ridiculous. I'm going to have a huge right arm, and the rest of me is going to look what? Pretty pathetic like it does now. <laughs> but, 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 what the? What? The, like what? Why is it my family laughs loudest? I, <laughs> but the point is this, is that when one member of your body is doing all the work, then the rest, what? It ends up dying off. It ends up dying off. When the one part of the body is doing all the work and we need to recognize this. It's not just the pastors and the other elders, if we had others. It's not just the deacon's job. It's not just the music leader's jobs. But it's all our job. Not just one part of the body keeps the body moving. The whole body moves. And, and, and uh, we do what? Some of us have lessons. Again, some of us may have revelation, tongue, interpretation, things that are building up the body of Christ, encouraging the body of Christ. Verse 27 and 28, If any speak in a tongue... Let there be only two or three at most, and each one in turn, and let someone interpret. Again, God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of order. It does not help if I stand up here and I start reading the Bible in the original Koine Greek, and you guys have never heard Greek, and I just do the whole sermon in Greek. How does that build you up? How does that teach? How does that encourage? It wouldn't do it at all. And it wouldn't talk. And that's the point God, uh, Paul's making, that God's making through Paul and his writing. If you're not doing something that everybody can understand, you either A, need somebody to interpret, interpret it, or don't do it at all. It isn't, as we said last week, about you. It's about us as a whole. You notice he says a set number, two or three. Tongues is not uncontrollable. If there's 12 people in here that could do tongues, that only two or three of them are to speak. That's, that's the biblical commandment. Each in turn. They don't all talk at the same time. Uh, you might say, well, what about Acts 2? When the Holy Spirit came and they were out, out in the, amongst the city and they were all talking at the same time. Well, that's when the Holy Spirit first appears and it wasn't in a church service. They're all going out, and they're all speaking, and they're all praising God, and they're all, the Spirit is. But I also want you to notice what also happened during then. While they were talking in tongues, what were some of the people saying? Some were saying, they're speaking in gibberish, they must be drunk. Some were saying, I hear in my own language from where I am from. And they heard the gospel, and they understood. There was a purpose behind it at the, at the point. If there isn't an interpreter, stay silent. Verses 29 to 33. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy, prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And all spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all Churches of the saints. Prophecy, as we said last week, it's a word, it's a word from God. They didn't have the New Testament. They had prophets amongst them that would were, were guide were uh, that were inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak and teach. And how did they judge them? They judged it by two ways. One, like the Bereans. They they judged it by the scriptures. They examined the scriptures. But here the commandment is what? that the other prophets in the room would listen to them and they would judge what they would have to say. A prophet would be judged by a prophet. 
The closest, again, the closest thing we have today to that would be preaching, but it's not the same. I am not inspired directly by the Holy Spirit. The, word, the, the words and the teaching, where the teaching comes from where? The Holy Scripture. I'm got, called and guided by to explain and, ex, and, and, and apply those Scriptures to your life, but I'm coming from somewhere. It's not coming from God directly. You guys understand that? I'm preaching from the Scriptures. The prophets were preaching directly a communication from God. From God to prophet. In this case, it's God to Bible to pastor. Does that make sense? Or did I just confuse everybody? I see some nodding. Okay. All right. So, again, prophecy is a word from God for teaching God's people. And, and they were to judge. For God is what is not a God of confusion, but a God of order, or as my translation says, peace. He's not meant to, to cause a ru- God does not cause a ruckus. God does not cause disorder. Remember, He creates the world, and what is it? does He say about it? It's good. It's good. He creates day and night. He says what? It's good. There's an order around everything that God has done. He does not God cause confusion and disorder. Generally, confusion is usually caused by what? Most of the time, us. <laughs> Most of the time, it's us that causes confusion and, and, and mixes things up. If you leave here confused, brothers and sisters, it was all me. It had nothing to do with God. It was all me. When I, I, I find that when I try to decide what I would rather preach, God, God brings me something, and He says, hey, I want you to preach on this this week, and I feel inspired to preach on something else like I did a couple of weeks ago. I'm always worried that it, it's me that wants to preach on something. A couple of weeks ago, I preached on what? Repentance. True repentance. I was really worried because I'm always worried. I, I was thinking, now does God really want me to preach on this? Or is this something that I, I think that, that people need to hear? It's always a stressor for me. And I can't tell you how happy I was when praises and prayers came up and what's the first thing that popped up? Gary stands up and says, I need to repent of something. I'm like, okay, it is the Holy Spirit. It relaxed me completely for that. For that. It is us, when we put ourselves into the mix, where we confuse things. All right, so the verses that I've been trying to avoid all morning, verses 34 and 35. The women should keep silence in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. All right, first off, submission. Ugh. None of us like submission. Not women, not men, not anybody. Hebrews thirteen seventeen. this one's for all of us. Obey your leaders and what? Submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as they who will have to give an account. This is talking about me in this case. I have to stand before the Lord and give an account for every single one of you. That did I teach you all that the Lord inspired me to teach you and asked me to teach you? Did I confront you when I knew about open sin? Did I pray for you? These things. I have what some consider a huge job Most of us don't look forward to standing in front of God for our own account. But it's the pastors that have been in your lives that have walked with you and, and talked with you taught and taught you that have to uh, stand before God. And God commands us to obey our leaders and submit to them. Submit to our leaders and laws in our own government. This is probably one of the least favorite ones for most of us. Whether we agree with it or not. We 
Romans 12, verses 1 to 7, we are to obey the laws of our, our government. Titus 2, 9, bond servants are to, submit, are to be submissive to their own masters and everything they are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. That's us as in the places we work. We should be doing our jobs as if Jesus himself gave us the commands for our jobs. To do them as long as it does nothing against the law of God. And that's the same in any of these cases. Ephesians 6, 1-3. Parents, nudge your children now. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. And then everybody's favorite, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Let all you husbands, let us ignore the part. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church whom he died for. These verses are focused on these verses from 1 Corinthians are focused on the relationship between husband and wives and is really a translation issue. Part of the art of translation is also an interpretation of, of, of it. That's why you can read so many different in, uh, translations and see different, different things. I believe that wives were questioning their husbands in front of the, in, in front of the church uh, when they're speaking. Why? Because back in chapter 11, you might remember, Paul had already given instructions on, for women on praying in church and prophesying in church. And to do such, you would be speaking in church. And, and Paul points back to the Old Testament law, because this is how God set the system, of wife, uh, system up. A wife is to uplift her husband to others. My, I didn't understand it for a long time, but Cindy is a blessing in this. Cindy, uh, you know, every once in a while, I would hurt her feelings because I, I would make a joke or, or a crack or something, and she would later on, she would tell me, she goes, you know, I never say anything bad about you to anybody else. If I've got a problem with you, she'd tell me at home. But she always put my best face to others, and it was truly a blessing. But here, ladies and gentlemen, your marriage is a picture of our marriage to God. Your marriage is a picture of, of how Jesus submits to the Father, how the church submits to Jesus. It's a picture of, of that. And, and when you confront your husband openly in, in church, whether he's an idiot or not, it doesn't say only if he's not dumb. It doesn't say only if he's not telling you stupid stuff, but it says submit to your husband. And if you have a question, what? Ask him at home. Cindy has often done that. Why did you say that when we get home? I didn't understand why you said that, but she waits till we get home to ask. And there have been times when I've come and I've thought about it, and I come back from a question that Cindy's asked me, and, and I'll correct myself. But why do we do these things, all these things? I want you to think about this. What's this three chapters been on? We do it what? Out of love. Love for one another. Love for our husbands. Love for our friends. Love for the people that don't know Jesus. And again, it's an agape love. That love where you're giving and you're not expecting anything in return. You're giving of yourself and not expecting anything to return. I want you to think about this. You cannot share the gospel with someone in a, any sort of meaningful way at all if you truly don't love that person. Think about it. Have you ever tried to share the gospel with someone that just irritates the snot out of you? And you're looking at them and you could think, I could care less if this person's saved or not. You know, Jesus died for you. I'm sure that speaks well. Jesus died for you, and if you want to go to hell, that's fine. 
you're on your own. But think about it. If you truly love the person and you're actually t taking time to be part of their life, no matter how annoying they are, no, how ma no matter how frustrated you get with them, no matter how bad they may or may not hurt you, there are missionaries in this world that are, that are loving the people in the area that they're serving in, and some of those people could kill them like that. But they love them. Why, why should we bother to follow Paul? What are some things we've heard about Paul? Paul's just a sexist. I've heard that said about Paul. Oh, this is just, you know, something that Paul says, you know, that was back then, this is now. It was a cultural thing. Paul answers that question and he says, well, okay, 36, was it you that the Word of God came to? You know the Word of God better than Paul knows the Word of God? Or are you the only ones it has reached? You are the only true followers of God? This is a, a question I think I'd like to ask some churches that, that we have in our world today as you see what they have to preach and see what they tell. Because what's the problem with most churches is they decide what is and isn't the Word of God. So the God came to you and informed you what was true and what was not? This is Paul's question. If anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual or he should acknowledge the things that I, Paul, am writing to you are a command of the Lord. These are a command of God. As if God the Father opened up the sky and gave him the words directly to us ourselves. The voice came from the sky and said, Steve, it's God, Steve. And he gave the words and poured them out to Steve. These are the same authority. Paul says this, if anyone, he says, they're of the Lord. He is, he is putting on full apostleship. And remember, we spoke at the beginning of the book, what does it mean to be an apostle? Apostle spoke with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. And Jesus taught him. An apostle who is one who is sent. Jesus sent Paul. Remember, he found him on that road. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He spent three years in the desert, remember, if you remember the story. And, and he, he learned the ways of the Lord. And he comes to give the command of God. This is a command of the Lord as given to Paul as he gives it to us. And he said, and this is where you should be worried. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Here's the problem. It isn't the fact that Paul is so mighty and important. It isn't that, you know, Paul was supposed to be only like five foot something. He was a little guy. Paul even says he's not eloquent or attractive. It isn't any of that stuff. But the point is, is if you're not acknowledge his, acknowledging his teaching, you're not acknowledging the Father. When Jesus says jump, we say what? We jump. We don't even ask how high. He'll tell us if we're not jumping high enough. He'll look at Emma and say, Emma, why are you jumping so high? Don't jump so high. But we jump. Jesus says, run. We run. Brothers and sisters, we've been commanded to run a race. And who gets to call an end of that race? Jesus. And how do we know when that race has ended? We get called home. We get called home to be with our Lord and Savior. He says, so my brothers earnestly desire, he, he goes back to the original thing, earnestly desire to prophecy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. He's basically asking them and us, again, do you think you're so special? Do you think so? you're so special? Do you think you're more special than the Word of God? Do you think you're more special than His command? The final word is desire prophecy, don't deny tongues, 
And then in verse 40, again, back to what we spoke of. Do all things, all things should be done decently and in order. God, again, is not a God of chaos. God is a God of love. God is the one who planned before the foundation of the world was even set that we're told that the, the cross was set in stone, that the world was moving towards the cross. He is the one that is so orderly that he had your names written down in the book of life before the foundation of the world. He knew you before your great 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 grandparents even thought about having children. And he loved you and he died for you. Love God with all your heart, body, mind, and soul, and may it show in all things you do. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for these words. I pray that that in my life that your love should shine brightly that I would be an encouragement to all that I come in contact with, that I, that I would show in my life what is important in my life, and I pray that it would be God, first and foremost in all things. I pray for our congregation here at Cornerstone. I pray that we may continue to pray, con continue to share the gospel, continue to go into the world and be your holy ambassadors, crying out your words and your message. May your kingdom through our work here at Cornerstone be done. We pray this in the heavenly name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen.